<sighs> yeah, I do still have the flat cap. I'm wearing it today because I shoveled the driveway earlier and my hair got all sweaty and gross and I did not feel like prettying myself up for this video. So, James Somerton. If you don't know who he is or what's going on with him, that will not be the purpose of this video. This is not a drama video. This is not a recap. This is not me going through all the things that have gone on with him. If you don't know who James Somerton is and you don't know why so many people are talking about him right now. I'm going to recommend two videos. One from H Bomber Guy, one from Todd in the Shadows. The first one deals with plagiarism. The second one deals with lies. So if you want to know why a seemingly previously well-respected video essayist is now just on the tip of everybody's tongue for the worst reasons, watch those two videos and come on back. I'll see you in about seven hours. More realistically, I'll see you tomorrow. But regardless, I'm not going over all that. I'm not going over what he's... Doing, not doing, there are other people who can and will do that. I want to talk about what lessons can be taken from all of this. And over the course of this, I'll make reference to some of the stuff he did. But as I said, that's not the focus. I'm not going to go over that, any of it. Part of the reason why I'm doing this video is because when I talk about these things in general, I like to do it from a perspective that... I feel might actually add something to the conversation. And I'm not saying nobody is talking about what lessons to take from this, but that's usually part of a much bigger discussion about all of it. And I just want to narrow in on that. I'm also kind of hoping that if I do a video with my overall thoughts on this, which the takeaways are really all I have to say other than pointing you to the two videos I already pointed you to, then maybe this conversation won't dominate you know, my streams. <laughs> People won't have to ask me. It'll be right here. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. We'll see. The last thing I'll say before I get into this is I have really no personal stake in James Summerton. Not only do I not know him personally, I didn't even really know his work. I had heard his name intermittently, sometimes, very rarely. It would come up in my own comments section, usually in a positive light. And on a couple of occasions, his name came out of people who I know and trust and do similar work to what I do. And oftentimes then it was not said with uh, as positive a connotation. But I never watched any of his videos. They show up in my recommendations now and then, but usually he was either taking a look at a topic that I might have interest in, but coming at it from an angle that wasn't my interest in the thing, or it just looks so heavy that I'm like, I don't have the spoons for that, which happens sometimes. There, You should see my watch later playlist. It's ridiculous. There's tons of stuff in there that I'm sure is great. Some of it even made by friends of mine, but I'm like, I don't have the spoons for that right now. I'll get back to it when I do. And he seemed to cover a lot of stuff like that, but I am not personally offended. I've never watched his stuff. I never supported him. I really don't know much more than what I've been hearing about him as a person or even his work. But because those two videos that I mentioned earlier have so many receipts and are so very thorough in their citations of where they're getting their information from and being very upfront about where, the, about where their conclusions are more solid or more shaky, again, those are the places to go for that. I do have good faith that those videos are well supported and well backed up. Again, you can watch them yourself. But I feel like there's two main sets of lessons to be taken from this. There's lessons to take as viewers, and then there's lessons to take as creators. We're going to start with viewers first because, well, more of my audience are just viewers and not also other creators. And the back half is going to be a little bit more navel gazy. So, uh, I figure I'll give people the option to duck out if they're not interested in the back half. Yeah, see? <laughs> I'm willing to hurt my own metrics. If I was smart, I'd save the stuff that applies to more people for the back half and force people to watch more of the video. Apparently, I'm more considerate of your time than I am of my own engagement. This is why I haven't broken 100,000 subscribers yet. Ah, well. This is just me. So... I think the main thing that seems like the obvious thing, but it's really a lesson that we apparently have to keep relearning, confirmation bias. I mean, most of us know that term. The general idea that you read or hear or see something that agrees with a general, sometimes a specific, but just a belief that you have. And because it matches something you already believe, you don't interrogate it and you don't 
question it with the same scrutiny as you would something that is saying something that you don't agree with. The thing is, whenever I see people talking about confirmation bias, they're usually talking about, well, cranks, to be honest. They point at people like Alex Jones and say that confirmation bias and conspiratorial thinking is the only reason anyone would believe or listen to someone like him. And yes, that is a factor, but confirmation bias can blind us to somebody who looks like they know what they're talking about. The appeal of somebody like Alex Jones to someone who already leans that way of thinking is finally somebody saying the things that I know to be true. And that can be there and that can get people into more extreme ways of thought, but it can also just cause us to not examine something because we think, yeah, that sounds about right. And if it's presented in a far more professional fashion, we're going to be a lot less likely to question whether or not we've got confirmation bias on it. Which kind of brings in the second thing. I think we forget sometimes how much professional appearance and confident presentation can trick us into just accepting somebody's authority. We accept and believe and trust that they know what they're talking about because the way that they present themselves really seems like they did their research. And it also helps that in the case, of, well, I say helps, hurts, hurts us, helps him. In the case of someone like James Somerton, he claims to have done research. And when somebody claims that they've done research, especially if we're already inclined to agree with the types of conclusions that he's coming to, well, we're usually going to take his word on that. If only because to not take his word on that means to do our own research and fact check everything that he said. And again, we're far more likely to do that with someone we don't agree with than with someone we do. We'll just go, oh, well, he said he researched it. So yeah, I'll, I'll trust his summations. And like, he's citing sources. So, you know, he wouldn't do that if, if, if they didn't agree with what he was saying. There are problems with that assumption too. But again, check out the other videos for that. He didn't cite often. And when he did, it was poorly. But just the appearance of citations can give a sense of authority to something. Again, that presentation, presenting something in a confident tone of voice, with that sense of authority, with that tone of, I've looked into this, and so I've come to the conclusion for you. You don't have to think, you just have to listen. I think the left has gotten very good at noticing the, you don't have to think, I've already done it for you technique that the right uses very frequently. This is core to things like the Daily Wire and a lot of the outrage merchants on here, but the left can do it too. Not necessarily for the same political ends, although also, yeah, sometimes, but just for financial gain. Because we have a tendency to just assume that somebody who says they looked into it actually did. And until we find reason to disbelieve them, we tend to just default to that. There's a bit from the novel version of Good Omens that I always loved and bugged me a little bit that they didn't put it uh, into the first season, but I love this idea because there's some people trying to break into what is effectively a nuclear facility and it's basically pointed out that like getting in is the hard part. Once you're in, as long as you act like you're supposed to be there, people just assume you are because, well, if you're here, okay, I guess you're supposed to be here. So unless you act super suspicious, they're not going to question it. This is kind of the academic video essay equivalent of the same thing. Well, you're here, you're presenting it in a way that seems, that seems good, passes the sniff test to most people. Yeah, yeah, you must be right. Again, a lot of it comes down to, this is a harsher word than I mean it, but laziness. And I don't mean that audiences are lazy and they should have checked everything he said. No. If you wanted to do that, you would literally be doing your own research and probably be making better video essays than people like James Somerton do. But if you're an audience, you're here to get somebody else's summation and conclusions. And even if you sometimes question, well, I'm not sure about that, we tend to still accept that somebody did the base level work based off of a certain amount of confirmation bias, a certain amount of it's just presented so well, but also we have to tackle the fact that James is gay. That's the lens that he generally puts on it. And 
as much as there are certain aspects of the left and the queer community in specific that can have infighting and eat at each other, by and large, that also can lead to a reluctance to call each other out. Because here's the thing. Trying to call out James Summerton prior to the videos that I linked before, and I'll come back and circle on why I think these ones have broken through, it was frankly kind of hazardous because you risk not only the standard thing of calling out any sizable YouTuber, which is his fans would come and defend him and possibly attack you over it, but in addition to that, even people who might not necessarily consider themselves fans of him are possibly going to jump to his defense simply because we see so much of queer creators just being torn down because they're queer, but under the guise of so many other things, we're a bit hypersensitive to it. H Bomber guy actually brought that up in his own video that part of what made him nervous when he first started looking into this is, yeah, there is a lot of false accusation, a lot of nonsense said about queer creators and you don't wanna to contribute to that. And as an open bisexual who knows what the internet is like, I'm vigilant to the possibility the phobes are making a fuss about nothing again to take down a fellow gay boy. It does happen. But on the other hand, you don't want to contribute it, but you also don't want to get accused of contributing to it even if you're not. It's difficult sometimes to criticize things when the other people making similar criticisms are people you don't want to be associated with. It's difficult to be critical of something for a reason that you feel very passionate about, in the case of someone like James Summerton, that he lies and steals material, and you're going, this, this guy's content is actually bad and people shouldn't be watching it, and then you look over next to you to see the other people saying this, and a good chunk of them are people who uh, don't like the queer community for bigoted reasons. I mean, this has happened to me on a lower scale, God, years ago even. I had fundamental issues with the 2016 Ghostbusters movie, just the idea of it. Not because it was women, but because it was a continuity reboot, and that annoyed me. But I had to be, even back then, quite careful about how I talked about my criticisms of that, because looking around next to me at who else was getting annoyed at the very prospect of that movie, and it was a lot of sexists. And sometimes you just decide, I don't even want to risk association with these people. I'll just keep my mouth shut. But that's the other thing. Not everyone did keep their mouth shut. It should not have taken these two videos to blow the lid off of James Summerton. Because there are people, many of them from within the queer community, who have been signaling that there's something wrong with this guy for a long time. But because of the inherent desire of both his audience and other content creators, other queer content creators in specific, to want those accusations to not be true, it generally got ignored. And I don't think like purposefully, I don't think people were like, we cannot, this is our precious boy and you cannot have him. I think it's much more a case of Unless somebody came with so much overwhelming evidence, when you're hearing things one at a time, when you're hearing this incident of plagiarism, when you're hearing this thing that that's not accurate, and you're hearing them in isolation until somebody compiles this stuff, which is what H Bomber Guy and Todd in the Shadows did, it can be easy to brush off or to compartmentalize or to think, okay, well, that's just a thing that happened that time. But other people either didn't have the time, the means, or the stomach to present everything. And they shouldn't have had to. There were enough people, often enough, signaling that something's off here. It shouldn't have been necessary for someone to compile all this stuff into a cornucopia of evidence that can't be ignored in its volume, even if some of the specific incidents are stronger than others as far as the evidence goes. But it did come to that because of a combination of confirmation bias, our defaulting to a sense of authority. Like, again, to make the comparison to the right, 
There's a reason that people have a tendency to gravitate or get pulled in by folks like Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson. Shapiro presents his stuff very confidently. Peterson couches his stuff in academic language and it brings a sense of authority and it's easier to just assume that they're right, especially if you're already kind of at least leaning in that direction. But we are not immune to the same thing. So as an audience, what do we do? Well, like I said, you can't expect an audience to just fact check everything. It would be nice if audiences would be more willing to listen when someone who has fact checked something goes, hey, wait a minute. But that's sort of addressing fan culture in general, and I don't know how to fix that. Here's what I will say. For me, the most frustrating thing about what's happened with Summerton is how stuff proliferated out from him, especially his lies. You know, the plagiarism and him effectively taking credit for other people's thoughts, already not good, but he would just say nonsense. And then people would cite him when they would repeat it because they assumed he did research and they assumed he had something to back that up, but he often didn't. So while I'm not gonna say you need to double check everything a video essay says, because no, you shouldn't have to, but at the very least, if you're going to repeat something that you've only heard from them, get a second source. And to make your life a little easier, I personally at least would consider a second source to include whatever source they claimed they got it from. Because at the very least, you can go and check and go, oh, this is what he brought up. And yeah, that says what he said. That at the very least before you spread it. And that is honestly starting to lean into an issue more with creators because fans, you know, you absorb stuff. You don't always remember where you get it and you say it again. And fans don't necessarily have the most responsibility to not spread it. It'd be nice if they took a little, but like, again, I don't think that's reasonable just as human beings. But that starts to pivot us into creators and what lessons creators can learn. And we'll start with um, your, your source for anything you're going to repeat yourself on a podcast or a uh, YouTube video should probably not be other creators unless they are talking about their own direct experience or they conducted their own interviews or whatnot. If they are the primary source, okay. If they're not, probably best to check what their primary source was before you repeat it. Um, you know, just as a general thing, if you're able to. Of course, that requires proper citations, which James didn't really do, so that complicates things. But maybe then question, oh, there wasn't a citation for that, and I can't find it. Maybe I shouldn't repeat it. But let's go fully into what creators can learn from this. And yes, I'm going to focus this pretty much through my own lens and my thoughts and how I go about creation. But Let's see what I'm learning, and maybe that'll help others, or you'll at least find it interesting. Now, when I say these are the lessons that I'm taking, these are things for me to watch out so that I don't appear to be anything like James Summerton. Now, like, just the core of what I do is not what he did. And I don't even just mean, like, the plagiarism and the lying. I mean, I don't really consider myself to be a video essayist. I just don't. I've done a couple of things that I think could probably qualify under that, but that's not what I consider myself to be. That's not my primary thing. I am more than anything into media analysis and criticism. And the thing about analysis and criticism is they are primarily, if not entirely, based off my views and my opinions. And you can't really fact check an opinion, and I can't really back it up empirically with citations. The way that I go about what I do is pretty much to tell you my views on a thing and do my best to explain why I have them, but I'm generally not trying to present something as this is the absolute factual truth. I'm presenting something as this is what I'm taking away from this or this is the lens I'm viewing this through. And again, a big part of my focus is to be sure that people understand why I have come to the conclusions or have the perspective that I have, even if they don't agree with me. And since most of what I'm talking about is here's 
the lens of analysis I'm putting on this, and that's not specifically like an academic lens, like this is a Marxist reading of this work. I'm not that academically inclined. So I don't claim to do that kind of thing. I just have the perspective that I do. That having been said, sometimes I do things that are much more about things that I need to be sure that I get right. Now, the plagiarism aspect, I'm not super concerned about for my own work get it going forward, mostly because uh, if you didn't realize this, I don't script much. The vast majority of what you see on this channel, including what you're watching right now, is technically unscripted. I say technically insofar as I have notes, I have bullet points, and I may or may not have started to sort of talk this through like, I don't know, while making breakfast or taking a shower or shoveling the driveway. And I've started to go over it just to sort of format maybe the order I want to do things and figure out what the tangents my brain is liable to go on and try and determine it in advance. Is that a tangent worth hitting? But I don't script the vast majority of what you see. So it's hard for me to plagiarize. You can't really copy and paste somebody else's words into a script if you don't have a script. Now, is it possible for me to like, take somebody else's idea and kind of repackage it? Yes, that's possible. I don't do that intentionally. And I don't think I've really done that in a significantly notable way, even unintentionally. But at the very least, by virtue of the fact that it's unscripted, I can't be presenting it exactly the way that they did because I didn't write this down. That's not to say that I never script. But the times that I script... They tend to be things where I either really need to be careful about how I'm formatting the entire thing. Like if I don't do these things in this order, then my conclusion doesn't land correctly. And rambling and just seeing how it pulls together isn't the way to address that. Or it's something with a lot of specific facts that I need to get right. And if I don't, the entire thing is pointless. So some examples of stuff that I have scripted and scripted really thoroughly include things like the video earlier this year that I did on transgenocide. Video from last year about the Don't Say Gay bill. Those are two examples where I scripted it because I was talking about laws. I needed to look up what the laws actually said, and I would put that information up on the screen. So those were scripted. But I wasn't going to other people's summations. In those specific instances, I was going to the core things. I did see some people's summations like, this is basically what this law means. I'm like, can I see the actual thing? And sometimes it would be in legalese I couldn't parse. And if that was the case, I probably wouldn't even bring that one up. But if I could feel that I understood it, I was going to primary sources on that. But that's the kind of stuff that I actually script. Either that or sometimes things where I want to be sure I don't put my foot in my mouth. Um, so an example there would be uh, the video that I did on disability representation uh, and also the one that I did on Fat Thor. Those are cases where I'm talking about um, elements and aspects of life and people and bodies that are not my own personal experience and aren't things I typically talk about. So those were scripted just to be sure that I didn't say something harmful. <laughs> Not only were those ones scripted, but I also ran them by friends of mine who would have very valid opinions on these topics. So those are the other things that are scripted where I'm kind of stepping out of my lane a little bit. Basically, if I feel like I want to talk about something because I think it's important, but it's not something that I feel so knowledgeable about that I can go off the cuff, that I will script. But again, I'm not summarizing other people's stuff. I'm pulling my thoughts, my examples, and consulting with my friends. So the plagiarism aspect for me, as someone who doesn't really script, I don't really super have to worry about that one. Except for the citation aspect. Because plagiarism at its core is just taking somebody's work and words and presenting it as your own. Yes, even if you change some of the order of the wording or some of the specific individual words. If you're still formatting it the way they formatted it and saying what they're saying and you pulled it from them and you can put them side by side and go, that is pretty much the exact same sentence. That is plagiarism regardless of whether you cite it or not. But citation is something that I need to be better about. Looking at these kind of woke me up to that because I have a tendency... When I do citations, like 
I'll look stuff up, especially if it's a quote. And every now and then I'll pull a specific article. And in some cases, I'm a little bit saved by the fact that if I'm showing headlines or talking about headlines in the news, I show you some of them. Or if I'm talking about comments from my comment section, I will show them to you. But that only gets me part of the way there. Because like if I'm talking about the media response to something, yeah, I'll take a screenshot of a headline and you'll see where it came from. Cool. I still should be linking to that in the description so that you know I didn't Photoshop it. Because personally, I'm honestly too lazy to even try and do that. But it would be a valid concern. Even taking a screenshot and presenting it, that's something, but that's not a proper citation. Similarly, when pulling quotes from people, often creators, I will often just find a place that reported on when they said it. It may or may not be the primary place where they said it, like if it was from an interview or something, but I'll often screenshot that so that I can just drop in a screenshot and not have to retype and figure out how to format uh, for the best visual presentation the this quote because I'm not a I'm not a visual designer like at all. There's a reason I pay somebody else to do my thumbnails. A quick sidebar: if you're not following my thumbnail guy uh, Joel on Twitter at this handle, you really should. He's really talented. He does original art there as well, and he's also quite funny. Joel's great. And thank goodness he swept in to save me from my own ineptitude on the thumbnails. But something visually that I can take a shortcut, I will. Partially out of, yes, laziness. Other than the thumbnails, I'm a one-person operation. But in addition to that, because it was stuff that I didn't think required me to do more than I was doing. But the thing is, even if I pull a quote, even if I source it from somewhere, I should still be saying what that source is if for no other reason, that if the source is wrong, I can point to it and go, oh, that's why I made a mistake because I got it from here and they were wrong. Now, you can then decide to make your own call as to whether I should have caught that or not. But if I just pull a quote and it's wrong and I don't cite where I got it from, then it's on me because I didn't tell you where it came from. And my citation, regardless of whatever research I did or didn't do, if I don't put where I get the information from, then my citation amounts to, trust me, bro. And I shouldn't be doing that. And I didn't think of myself as doing that because I know the back end. I have a bias in terms of bias of knowledge of how much work I do put into these. I know the research that I do but I have to show my work and make it clear to you the research that I do. You may or may not have noticed, you probably didn't, that in my most recent review of Doctor Who, that when I put up um, a bit of a clip from a, an interview with Russell T. Davis and David Tennant, I put a citation of what the show was. When I pulled a quote, from Russell T. Davis talking about that he didn't intend to retcon The Timeless Child, I put a little citation at the bottom saying where he originally said that. That actually even wasn't technically where I got it from, but the place where I got it from cited where it did come from originally, and that's what I put there. I'm going to try and start doing that going forward whenever, especially if I'm pulling a quote or I'm pulling a clip, because it didn't honestly occur to me for people to think that if I, say, pulled a montage that somebody else made, that they'd think I actually did it. Because again, I don't do much fancy stuff. And I don't know if I have specifically done that. But if I have, and anyone thought that I did more work than I did, well, that's undue credit to me and not proper credit to whoever did it. And this doesn't mean that you can't take stuff from other YouTubers, there are a handful of clips that I've used in the past and probably will use again. Clips such as... If you know it's bad, why are you doing it? The fan base is f***ing exhausting. And I will continue to use stuff like that, but 
I need to start citing specifically where it is coming from. And that is something that I should have been better at long before this. And I'm just going to chalk this up to a blind spot because I didn't approach what I did through an academic lens. Like I said, I don't consider myself a video essayist. But even the stuff that I did heavy research on, I didn't cite as well as I could have or should have. I know I did the research, but if you were to ask me now, hey, what's what's the exact source? Like, can you give me a link for your source on that? I'd have to go find it again because I didn't put it on the record. And that's just bad work on my part. Something that I think both Todd in the Shadows and H Bomber Guy brought up, which I think is valid, is we tend to think of YouTube has a little bit of the Wild West, like, ah, there's no rules. Well, there should be. In many ways, there aren't. There's terms of service, technically, gets violated frequently and people don't get punished and people get punished for violating it when they, in fact, did not. But, like, honesty, transparency, there's no enforcement mechanism for that stuff here. The... Dealing of misinformation basically comes down to stuff that is like fully, completely debunked. And if YouTube allows to stay up, they are potentially going to get in legal trouble. So that's why like they'll pull vaccine misinformation. But YouTube has neither the time nor the ability to check everything that is allowed to go up. It's a pretty much open door policy. And we kind of have to do our best for our own stuff and police each other to a certain degree which I guess is ultimately what H Bomber Guy and Todd in the Shadows did. But as I said, they shouldn't have needed to come in and sweep in with this overwhelming evidence because people were trying to bring attention to this and just being shut down, ignored, or not listened to. And as I said, I think there's responsibility, some for the audience, but a lot for creators. This is a reminder that even if you don't do what James Somerton did, which is to flatly steal people's, people's words and thoughts and ideas and flatly lie about things, even if you don't do that, which I don't, again, think I ever have, but even if you don't, you can still learn, oh, I can still improve. Like, he fell short in so many areas that I could be better on. Am I as bad as him? No, but that's not the baseline. That can't be the metric. It can't be, well, I'm not doing what he did. Okay. That doesn't mean that you're doing enough. So, for myself, going forward, I'm going to try real hard to be better about citations, both in the body of the video and if it is appropriate, with links in the description. Honestly, links in the description is what I am more likely to forget to do. So if I say something and it's not cited, call me on it. Please. I'm one person with ADHD. This is, this is not something I am naturally inclined to be good at. But I'm going to try. Because while I know I am not James Somerton, I want to push myself for just to be as far away from even being close to the kind of nonsense he pulled. And the least I can do is get better about the citations. And I intend to. So those are my thoughts on all this and the lessons for us to keep in mind as viewers, especially as creators, going forward so that we can have a little less of this, maybe, in the future. Potentially, at least. That'd be nice. As I said, this was not meant to be even an overview of the stuff that he did. But if you have any thoughts on what I have said, in specific about what lessons can be learned, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills. and enables me to do this as my living. And even if you can't help me out that way, there's other stuff that I do. There is links for those things in the description. Those are always there because that's a 
permanent template. So those don't get forgotten. But like, share, subscribe also help. Don't worry about it. What, what, what I really want you to remember, viewer or creator or both, you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council, and I am just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Time to thank some patrons, and this time I'm going to say their names as if I'm greeting them, welcoming them to a party. Robin Moore, Zubin Lafula, Goddess Elida, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Ruth, Gozer the Gozarian, Oliver B, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Melinda Walters, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Fanabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, Rosalind Bennett. Have fun tonight, and thank you for your support. I don't know why I decided to do that this time, but I don't know. I'm having fun.